Our next speaker is going to share his experience developing and publishing for Android. He's the CEO and co-founder of Creative Mobile from Tallinn, Estonia. He was 23 years old when he built one of the largest mobile gaming companies in Northern Europe with Nitro Nation Drag Racing, a game that has amassed over 100 million downloads on Android and over 12 million on iOS. He's been the driving force behind the Nitro Nation Drag Racing series, which now includes the Android exclusive spin-off Drag Racing 4x4. Please, let's welcome Vladimir Funtikov. Uh, thanks, Vincent. Uh, thank you all guys for choosing to visit my speech today. I'm flattered to see so many people here. Maybe I'm just hallucinating because I haven't slept for two days, but I just hope it's real and you all chose, chose to listen to me. And uh, today I, I'm hoping to cover two topics. I want the speech to include practical advice for publishing on Android, uh, the way we did it, without external funding, without connections, just you know, the way most indie developers do it. And uh, I also want to speak a little bit about my company because that's what's supposed to give me credibility for this talk and that's where all the practical examples come from. Uh, so let me start by introducing Grave Mobile. We are a development publisher, like Vincent said, based in Tallinn. And uh, we founded the company three years ago. It was just me and two of my former colleagues and we didn't have anything. We didn't have money, we didn't have friends among Apple editors, we didn't have VCs supplying us with funds in advance and exposure. But somehow, we got a few things right and we made our way to where we are now, to 100 million downloads on Android, just Android, and most of this are organic. And this is going to be the focus of my talk, how do you get organic traffic on Android? And uh, we are best known for our drag racing games. The original drag racing, which, is, which was our breakthrough title, and it's just massive. And uh, all the spin-offs, we have Bike Edition, which was launched in last, last April, and we have Drag Racing 4x4, which is going live in a couple of days. So we have a new release coming up really soon. And I think I should start by saying, uh, by explaining why we chose to work with Android. Uh, three years ago, Android was largely unknown. It was a risky bet. The platform was small. There were only a couple of devices on the market. But the competition was also very weak. And uh, we had a very compact team. We didn't have any experience making games. We didn't have any experience running a gaming business or any independent business. Uh, so we looked at ourselves and uh, decided that we don't have what it takes to compete on the App Store because App Store was all over the media. It was you know, the hottest topic. All the big companies were already making really nice games with big marketing budgets. And we thought, we aren't going to compete there. We'll focus on Android. And if this thing takes off, we will take off with it. And that's very much the way it happened for us. And uh, now the situation is a little bit different. Now everyone recognizes Android is the, the big thing. There's a lot of money to be made on that platform. But still, uh, in my opinion, in, in most uh, genres, the competition is a little bit less intense than the App Store because many big companies still outsource Android development. They still launch iOS first and Android later. So it's a little bit easier to get in there. And of course, the obvious reason to develop Android is the scale. There's just so many devices, there's so many players, there's so many money to be made in this business. Back to 2010, we didn't have any money, didn't have any connections, didn't have any traffic, no brand. This is myself three years ago, and that's how our team looked back then. So we faced a problem. We made a few games, we loved making games, but how do you launch, how do you promote it, how do you make money with it? One obvious solution would be to come up with a nice presentation and show it to potential publishers, investors, editors, and I hope that at some point you get invested into or you get featured or, well, something good happens to you and you'll be suddenly propelled into the elite publishers. But we didn't consider that an option first because we kind of underestimated our own potential and then we didn't have, you know, we didn't know where to go for this VCs and investors and editors. So we chose the other way. That would be to work with what we got, use some very cheap marketing tools and uh, free marketing tools we had at our disposal and make sure we maximize the effect from these tools. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this 
free opportunities, which we exploited back then and continue to focus heavily even now. Uh, three years ago, the only way to get free exposure on Android market was the Just In category. And Just In was basically a list of applications that keep, get published on the store. So we got to spend a few hours on this list until you are pushed out of the list by newer apps. And now it's been replaced by top new free and top new gross and I think list that kind of make more sense given the scale and the number of applications published. But the principle is the same. You get some free exposure and you have to maximize the effect. And we started by working with the titles and icons of our games because that's what the player sees in this list. That's what makes him make the decision because the attention span is milliseconds and you've got to come up with a combination of icon and title that sells your game immediately. And I have a good example, which I like a lot. One of our first games was a simple basketball game where you just you know, score three-point shots from a distance within a time limit. And we came up with a name which was fairly original. It was called Three Point Shootout. And we came up with a nice, detailed, original icon for the game, and it didn't work. I think 100 guys downloaded it in the first month, and we didn't make any money at all. And it took us a while to understand this, but a few months later we relaunched the game and we called it Basketball Shots 3D. And we put a nice big orange basketball on the icon. And that's a stupid name for a game, it's Basketball Shot. But it's got the keywords in it, 3D, basketball. It immediately sends the message that, guys, if you like basketball, you have to give it a chance. And this game, in its, you know, the republished version with the title and icon, which I described, got some 10 million downloads organically. And this was, I think, the point where we started making some money. If we didn't figure that out, if we continued to try to be original and come up with interesting titles and icons for our games, I would, prob I would probably not be here, and I would probably do, be doing something else. And um, with drag racing, we did the same. We came up with the title first, and we were sure that this title is going to sell the game to people. Because, it, again, it immediately sends the message that this is game Again, about cars. We placed a car on the icon, and anyone had an interest in cars, and that's a very large audience. We just give it a chance, because, you know, racing, drag racing, it's really obvious and straightforward. And uh, here on this slide, I placed three icons. That's the evolution of drag racing icon. And each of these iterations gave us a huge boost of downloads. And um, we also had some bad experiments. We had uh, some icons that we placed on the market and we saw a decline in downloads. But the point is, it really does matter and it makes a big difference. What kind of icon you have and how well does it help to sell the game and deliver the message, what this game is about and how well does it stand out. Now the way our marketing guys um, develop icons these days is they make half a dozen candidates that they think will work well. Then they take a screenshot of uh, top gross, you know, top free chart from iOS App Store or Google Play. And then they place these icons they came up with randomly in the list, substitute some apps with icons, and then they just, you know, do a test, show it to people and see what icons grab their attention. So we select a couple winners and then we kind of A-B test them. And a good way to do that is to create banner ads and, uh, you know, create one banner with icon A, one banner with icon B, just put them into ad mob and see what the click-through rate is. And you don't need thousands to do that. You, you, can do, you can get away with spending a couple hundred dollars on this kind of test. But then you know precisely what icon is the best. And that's super valuable. And of course, once uh, the player, the potential player has clicked your game, your icon in the App Store, he sees the first screenshot and the, few, the first lines of the description. And this is something that has to be polished and perfect as well. Some guys think that they have to tell a story through the screenshots. They have to start by showing the main menu of the application, then something else, something else. Point is, first one is the one that matters. It has to make an exp expression, an impression. It has to be stunning. And that's worth working on. It doesn't cost a lot to test different iterations, but it pays off. And the last thing we did with this you know, Google Play submission we included keywords in the description. It's kind of straightforward. A lot of people don't do that. Again, it's free to do. It makes a difference. Now, after we got our initial volume downloads, the next thing we needed to do was to keep ranking high. 
And uh, we spent a while reverse engineering the Google Play ranking algorithm. I don't know precisely what the formula is. Frankly, I don't want to know. But there are two metrics that matter most. Of course, the number of downloads, which is kind of averaged over a few days. Uh, so it's less volatile than App Store, and you can just buy traffic within several hours and rank high. It takes more than that. And another thing that matters is the number of active installs you have. And this kind of dictates the way you work with the game post-launch, because you need to keep this number high, so it's worth delivering relevant updates to keep peop people engaged. Sometimes, when you do push notifications, everyone knows push notifications are great, but if you deliver it to the wrong kind of user, they might just uninstall your game. That's going to be their response. Because they haven't played it for a while, they've forgotten about this game, but it's still on their phone and contributes to your ranking. But then you deliver this needless push, not push notification, and like, oh, I haven't, this, I haven't played this game for a while. I don't need it anymore, and they uninstall it. And I know there's at least a couple uh, software solutions that let you do that. Segment your players and deliver push notifications to those who are actively playing and leave the rest alone. And uh, of course, social competitive games have an advantage here. Uh, I think uh, on the third day of the conference, Bob Mace from Google will be presenting Google Play Game Services. Don't miss that one. It's a free tool which lets you improve retention and keep the players engaged in the game, and that helps a lot. Now, uh, the next important point we learned is to understand the platform and optimize the games in every aspect. Performance, loading times, distributive size. Again, I have a, a, an example from our own experience. We published a third-party game called Clash of the Damned, and uh, we tried desperately to explain to the developers that they have to optimize the download size. And the way they had this Originally, the APK was relatively small, but then when it launched, they presented the player with a screen that, where they had to wait until 100 megabytes download was finished. And we kept telling them that this is not the way to do it. They insisted that they've optimized it to the limit, there's nothing to gain here. But then we discovered that we lose around 70% players on that screen. So 10 players we acquire, seven are gone immediately. And when they realized that, they somehow found a way to optimize further and compress this to 30 megabytes or 20 megabytes. And now we're losing only 30% of players. So we effectively doubled our revenue per acquired user by just allocating a few development hours to optimizing textures and leaving some less necessary content outside the scope. And uh, the way we approach this now, we try to make content delivery really smooth not present the player with these terrible waiting screens, because like the previous speaker said, their patience is really, really low. You can't count on that. You don't expect them to you know, dedicate hours to your game, dedicate minutes to waiting for, no, for an update. And even tablets. Tablets are being promoted as awesome gaming devices, but they're gaming devices only part of the time. There are people who sit down with the tablet and spend two hours playing the game, but then they have their tablet in a bus without power supply, and they only have several minutes to play the game. So one thing we learned is that you have to make it possible to start the game quickly and play a short session, and then leave it and have some progress recorded. So we tried to avoid, avoid loading screens and you know, keeping the player waiting, because that's just terrible. Now I have another case study right here. Speaking about updates, last year we decided that drag racing was no longer looking the way a modern game on Google Play should look. It was rather cheap, and we reworked the UI, the graphics, the physics, everything. And uh, the results were really impressive. This is the top grossing chart from the US. And uh, we released an update on November 1st, and we jumped from uh, being ranked around 80th in, uh, across all apps to being ranked 11th. And that's just an update. This is not a new product launch. We just updated the game. We made sure the players knew about this. And we gained lots of positions in the grossing charts. And as a result of the strategy, we, drag racing has been in the top 50 games on Google Play for two years and running. And uh, this all is achieved with relatively small investments. Just keeping the game updated to make sure your players are happy. Now, after that, we faced the next set of problems. What do we do now? When we have lots of traffic coming in, 
What next? How do we monetize it? And our approach to monetization has evolved over the years. And right now it's composed of a number of revenue streams. I want to say that it's well known that on Google Play, average uh, revenue per user in terms of inner purchases is much lower than on the App Store. It's growing, but it's still not quite there. We've always relied on ad revenue. And uh, I think right now our ad revenue comes from four, four, five, maybe six sources. And that makes at least 50% of our total revenue. Because it just makes sense. Because designing the game to maximize revenue via in app purchases, sometimes you can't do it. For some games, it just doesn't work. For some games, you know, it, it requires a major overhaul. But games and media properties, like TV series, for example, people spend a lot of time watching, playing the game with their eyes on the screen. It just makes sense to deliver the right kind of ads at the right kind of moment. And uh, there's a lot of revenue in that, revenue potential in that. And another thing we've been doing very actively is trying to accumulate the players in communities. For example, we have a game page on Facebook. And uh, after two years, we've accumulated just, over two, just under 2 million fa Facebook fans on that page. And that's super valuable, because these people stay with you after the game is deleted and uninstalled. And you can use this community to cross-promote new products, to promote new games, games you publish, de deliver information about updates to your application. Now, that's a fantastic opportunity. And again, it's very cheap. It doesn't take a lot of time and money investment to set up a Facebook page and link to it from within the application. And when you have, you know, it keeps growing little by little. After two years, you have two million fans. That's, that's a serious force. And uh, case study, drug racing bike edition. A year ago, we decided to make an experiment. We decided to launch a new game, a spin-off of the original drag racing game, and spend nothing on promotion. Just see what can, we can achieve with work by working with our existing audience. And we got it into the top five downloads and top five grossing charts in the US without any user acquisition spent. Just made sure our players are aware that there is a new game, post it a few times on Facebook, and that's what we achieved. That was a, you no, know, saved us a lot of money because getting to top five on Google Play can be really, really costly. And um, I think I still have a couple of minutes left, but I think that's enough information for the talk. I have a sort of bonus track, which, is, which uh, covers and analyzes the launches of Real Racing 3, a big money blockbuster, and Hill Come Racing, a very cheap indie game on Google Play. It's included in the presentation. If someone is interested, it's kind of a bonus track to my speech. But I'm going to end it right now. And thank you all for listening to me. And I'll be happy to answer your questions. Uh, sorry, can you, can you say it again? Sorry. Um, you said uh, earlier on in the presentation you support it as... Uh, oh, platforms and devices. Yeah, so you wanted to support as many devices as possible when you and mm -hmm. all the different screen sizes. Um, how do you go about doing that? It's difficult, but it's difficult when you face this problem after having developed for iPhone and iPad, for example. We are coming from a Java mobile environment where we had 200 devices. And for, for us, it's natural. For us, Android was very simple. Guys coming from iOS development, they say, oh, how come we have to support 10 screen resolutions? But if you design the game from ground up with this limit, with this consideration in mind, it's, it's doable. It's, uh, the solution, a technical solution, is unique in each case. It depends on the way you organize your UI, the, how, how demanding is your game in terms of hardware requirements. But it's doable. Of course, now, now we're developing at least one very high-end title, and we can't just support every device when the game is, you know, has cutting-edge 3D graphics. We have to leave some people behind, but still we're trying to maximize the, the number of devices we cover because that really impacts the, the ranking you have. Because you can't just support a bunch of high-end devices and leave everyone else behind and get ranked based on, you know, that group of players you'll still be competing against applications that support every other device and get more downloads because of that. So that's kind of, it's difficult, but like the, the content delivery problem, it's doable and it pays off. Okay, so do you still, um, do you actually sit down and get testers and test with all the price that you can? 
Yep. Yeah, yeah. We can physically buy every device, I think. Drag Racer now supports around 3,000 devices. We don't have that, that much space in the office. Rent costs would be insane if we yeah. stored that all. But we, we look at the analytics data. We see what are the top devices and resolutions and GPUs and mix and match those and try to buy some most popular devices or devices that combine popular chipsets and test on that and pray that it works on all the other devices. Then we do a, a beta test run which uh, involves sending the game to several thousand people and that gives us some early feedback and if there's a problem we have some time to fix it before lunch. Again, it's, it takes time, it's difficult, it's boring. Everyone hates that because everyone wants to work on games and game mechanics and make the game beautiful and fun to play, but it just pays off. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have a question about, you mentioned segmentation uh, and push notifications. Uh, what tools do you use to do that? Right now we're using Swerve to do that. We are uh, using it in, uh, not in drag racing in a smaller title because we're still testing it, but early feedback is good. It's a very, it seems to be a very powerful tool, which is quite relatively difficult to integrate, but it lets us do a lot of cool things. I know there are simpler solutions. I think Play Heaven is one of those. Playnomics might be one of those things that let you segment users and uh, take some active steps. Uh, afterwards without that much investment. But it was difficult three years ago, now there's plenty of opportunities. What do you think is the optimal number as per session? As per before, session? Yeah, before people away. Uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, frankly, I don't know the optimal number because we haven't I think we haven't played with that. So did you actually do any measurement then to see if your daily active has dropped since you put in more ads? Yes, but not enough. Well, right now we are we're showing uh, banner ads and drag racing in every session because these don't interrupt the gameplay, so they just sit there. And we're also mixing incentivized ad, ads into the rotation because the CTR is much better on those. And uh, when we started showing interstitial ads, we were seriously worried about annoying players. Uh, the way we did that, we enabled these ads for new players only, not to annoy the existing fan base, and it limited our revenues in the first few weeks, but then it, you know, most players, you know, the, the older ones moved to other games, new ones came in, they accepted these ads. We didn't see any impact on retention or ratings whatsoever. We are showing ads once in two, three minutes of gameplay right now, we experimented with more frequent, less frequent. Results are inconclusive. OK, thanks. <coughs> Vlad, I have a question regarding the uh, experiment you did with Bike Edition, uh, trying to drive traffic organically to that game, and you saw great success with that. How much of that was just the quality of the game versus you know, the, the exposure to the... Well, the, the exposure to your existing user base. I mean, can, can, do you credit that just to the fact that you have such a large user base already? Or can you just go into a little bit more detail about why you think that happened and how that was successful? I can say, well, the, the quality of the game is higher than the original game, or it used to be back then, before we updated drag racing. Uh, it looked nice, but it wasn't high-end blockbuster. It, it was, by the standards of Google Play Store, slightly above average. We never focused on visuals in that one. We designed primarily for the existing audience and tried to reach the guys interested in bikes and bring them into the game, and we managed to do that. So uh, we attribute it to cross-promotion because if we launched it as a standalone title without any promotion to the existing user base, I don't think we would have achieved even a top 30 ranking. And the point I was trying to make, e even if the game is you know, really good, still promotion is expensive. Y there are some games that take off organically, but you can't really count on that. But you can count on cross-promotion. You can at least be sure that a certain percentage of your user base will help you push it 
And again, it's free, oh, almost free. Thank you. Do we have any other questions in the back row? Hi, Vladimir. I'm a big fan of the drag racing game, actually. And one of the things I've noticed that's kind of, especially if I'm on an airplane and I don't have Wi-Fi or internet, um, sometimes you run out of, say, like points to buy upgrades for your games. Um, but you can't acquire points like the RP through, um, uh, if you've already p completed levels and stuff in the curse, you have to go online and play against other users. I was wondering like, what's like the strategy behind that? Is it to drive people to buy RP or instead of just earning it? I have to start by saying that when we design drag racing, in-app purchases were not available on Google Play. So we launched it without in-app purchases, and of course we didn't have that in mind. So we bought it on the, the yeah, YAP framework layer when we had an existing audience, and that was rather big. So we were limited in our design options. So uh, monetization and drag racing is not optimal, and there are leaks in that. We know that, but we can change it. Mm -hmm. We can only change that in new titles because you can't, you know, redesign the economics of a game which has 10 million MAUs. You're going to face, you know, lots of resistance. Let's go with that. And uh, the original intent was to drive people to online play because that improves retention. Because people, lots of people love online competitions and when they, when they discover ways to, you know, invest their intelligence into building the car and gain an advantage based on that. This gets them addicted. And we have people playing after two years, still in the game, just you know, spending months on these tuning setups for cars because they can go to multiplayer and show everyone else what they're made of. So that, that, that was the intent. We didn't think from the monetization perspective back then. Thanks. Thank you, Vlad. Thank you very much. Great talk.